with the, the government. They, they do something and it becomes a scandal. Any number of things. I would argue that it's easier to run a country than it is to run yourself. And I think that's been shown in, in many instances. It's, it's almost easier to be king than it is to be master of yourself. And so often that's the case. Self-control is one of the hardest things that there is. But yet, we need to exhibit it. It's important that we exhibit it. It's important that we live it. You see, if we can control ourselves, then, then we can do so much more. When you look at the life of Christ, and you look at the moments He was in, the thing that, that, that kept Him through, obviously, because He's the Son of God and He had great wisdom, but, but look at the remarkable self-control that was exhibited. You know, sometimes we get upset when we get wronged, don't we? When people say things about us or do things toward us that we know just aren't right. We don't deserve that. But, but what about Christ being on trial? What about Christ being put on the cross? That was the ultimate. They didn't deserve what they got. But did, what does he say? How did he react? We sing the song. He could have called 10,000 angels. And he well, could have. But I'm glad he didn't do that. Instead, he accepted the wrong. He allowed people to have a false idea about him. People thought he was evil, thought he was wrong, thought he was blasphemous. But that was the furthest thing from the truth. The amazing self-control that Jesus exhibited all throughout his life and especially in his death is certainly a powerful thing. The self-control that Stephen exhibited when he was stoned, when Saul held the coats of those that did that. The self-control that he showed in living the way he did and seeking forgiveness for those that had done that to him. Self-control is always important. And I've come to realize, I will tell you, and, 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 I, and I'll tell you, young people especially, this, this is something that you, you hold on to for life. If you can control yourself, almost every situation you're in, every tense situation you're in, will be easier and better. Um, if you find yourself going into a difficult meeting, and it's something that maybe is because of a confrontation or a difficult thing that you've got to deal with at work or whatever... If you go into it determined, I will not lose control. I will keep my temper. I will keep a good attitude. I will be humble. I will maintain my best effort to be who I should be. I guarantee it will go better. The times in which I have been tempted and succumbed to temptation and gotten angry and got defensive, those tend to not go as well. But I can tell you all the difficult circumstances that I've gone into that I really wrap that around with prayer and I try to encourage myself to try to be as best as it can lie with me to be at peace with whoever is there. Even if they said things about me that weren't true, I can tell you from personal experience it goes way better when you, when you have self-control. And I, and I certainly... I certainly am not the poster child for, for self-control. I, I, I know that sometimes that, that I struggle with that, and I think most everybody here does. If you've got self-control all wrapped up and nailed down, you've got a, a great gift to teach the world, and please do it. You know, we struggle with that, don't we? And, and, but that doesn't mean we just cast it aside and say, oh, nobody has it. No, we can, we can exhibit it. And yes, I've grown in it, and I know... And I know enough about it to know when you have self-control, how much better things go. And I want to tell you that when you have control over your, your life and your thoughts and your attitudes and, and your actions, it goes so much better. It's the key to if you want to lose weight, if you want to stop a bad habit, if you want to start doing something, whatever it is, whatever facet of your life, if you're able to control yourself, you're going to do better at it. In, in, in vast ways. The text that Jensen read for us 
is one that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. Um, let's go there to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's look at that text. The Apostle Paul was writing to his son in the faith. And his son in the faith, Timothy, is certainly one that was um, a, very, a very good young man, a very uh, knowledgeable young man, a man that became very influential in the early church. But, you know, Paul, Paul realized that even Timothy struggled. And we all have our struggles. And, and, and when we look at the, uh, the text here, we're going to back up a few verses and start in verse 3. Um, instead of verse 7 where, where uh, Jensen read to us. But I want us to look at this. 2 Timothy 1 verse 3 says, I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, what is the reason? The tears that he had and the faith that was in him from his grandmother and his mother. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. The, the, the texts are different as to whether it's a self-control or a sound mind or self-discipline. But they're all the same thing. That we have, a, we have a mastery of, a control of ourselves. You see, Timothy apparently struggled. And as anybody would, a struggle with Christianity and, and struggled with the, the lifestyle and the difficulties. And Paul said, when I think of you, I think of your tears. And how much I want to see you. And I want to remind you of where you started out. I want you to be reminded of the faith that was in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I want you to take that and I want you to fan that. Well, you know what you do when you fan something. Fan it in the flame. Well, kind of reading between the lines, I see that that Timothy may be struggling and maybe his, his fire isn't burning as bright as it was. And Paul's telling him, fan that into flames. Go back to where you started. Remember where you were. Because here's what kind of spirit God's given to us. What kind of spirit's God given to us? God gave us a spirit not of fear... We, we don't give in to fear. We don't stop because of fear. We don't get paralyzed because of fear. But what kind of spirit did God give us? He gave us one of power and love and self-discipline. You see, when we give way to fear, when we give way to worry and doubt, when we give way to those kind of things, then we lose sight of what God has called us to be. God has called us to have power and love and self-control. God's called us to live a life boldly for Him. And that's what Paul was trying to draw out of Timothy. Timothy had apparently tears. Timothy had apparently some struggles with fear. And Paul says, you take what you've got, you take where you started and you fan it into flame and you build it up. And, and, and you recognize what God's given you. I would dare say that most every one of us has been right where Timothy was. We've had our moments of fear and doubt and worry. Our, our, our flame might not be as big as it was. And so what do we do? We go back to where we started. We go back and we fan that. We nurture that. We, we give it some more air and build it up. We use that self-control that God has given us. We use that power, that love that God's given us. Let's go to another text. Second, 
Uh, 1 Timothy, let me back up. 1 Corinthians 9. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. This is where we're going to spend the, the most of the rest of the time we have left um, in looking at this. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 is um, in this whole chapter. He's talking about his rights as an apostle, his right to, you know, he talks earlier in the chapter about that he and Barnabas weren't married, but they had a right to be. The, the other apostles were, the Lord's brothers were. He had a right to receive uh, payment or, or um, support from the gospel, but he exercised not to do that. He exercised the, the judgment to preach for free. But then here at the end of the, the, the chapter, verse 19 and following, we see really this, this text. If you, if you want to understand the mind of the Apostle Paul, of how he could be who he was, and what it took to be him, and what his focus and what his ministry was, you, you find that in this text. And I would want to challenge all of us that if we want to be the best Christian possible, that we will we'll, we'll adopt this attitude about others and about ourselves and what our focus and what our desire is. And it's all about what we're looking at today in self-control. Verse 19. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became like a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became like as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. That summarized just means that Paul did everything he could in every circumstance that he could to win as many as possible. He tried to be th all things to all men. It doesn't mean he was a chameleon. It doesn't mean he was hypocritical. It doesn't mean he did anything wrong. It's just that he didn't let himself and his own attitude and his own thoughts get in the way of trying to reach people. He was much less concerned about his own rights much less concerned about what he could or couldn't do, but instead of what he could do to reach other people. And he tried to become all things to all men. He tried to help those that were under the law, under the old covenant. He tried to help those that were outside of it, the Gentiles and such, did so that he might win as many as possible, that he might win some. And then look at this last few verses, verse 24 through 27. He says, Do you not know... Then in a race, all runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. The Apostle Paul said, when people run in a race, they, they try to exhibit self-control. You know, runners that, that really are serious about running, they're careful about what they eat. They're careful about what they drink. They're careful about the course that they run. They're careful about their shoes and their clothing. They watch out for what they're doing. And then when they're in the race, they don't run like a dog runs over here, and over there, and that, you know, they don't do that. They go on a straight course, don't they? 
They try to minimize the amount of steps that they take by going in as straight a line as possible. They exhibit self-control in which direction they go. They don't go to the right. They don't go to the left. They go right on the course. The Apostle Paul says, I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as somebody beating the air, shadow boxing. But instead, he says, I discipline my body. The, the old King James says, buffet. It's not buffet as much as you might want it to be. It's buffet. Hold back, discipline, keep in self-control your body. Doing that so that he might not be disqualified. You know what's amazing about that? Here is the Apostle Paul. The one that started all the congregations that he started, the many congregations that, that, that preached in many wonderful places, that had the Spirit of God with him, that wrote a big portion of the New Testament. And he realized that if he stopped having self-discipline, if he stopped keeping himself under control, he, he could also become disqualified. That's one of the strongest statements against always being saved as you're ever going to find. If all that the Apostle Paul was, still, if he stopped, if he quit, if he gave up, if he quit having self-discipline, he'd say, I could be disqualified. If there was the possibility, even the slightest possibility, that Paul could become disqualified, what about us? Well, how do we react to such a thing? How should we react? Well, we need to have self-discipline. We need to have self-control. We need to not run aimlessly. We should be purposeful. We should not beat at the ear. We should discipline ourselves so that when we live the truth, follow the truth, preach the truth, Maybe not from a pulpit, but we preach the truth by the way we live, the example that we set, what we teach our children, what we teach our family and friends, so that we, too, will not be disqualified. I'm thankful, though, that in the race that we're in, that everybody that finishes the course, as Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4, he says, I fought the good fight, I finished the course, answers a crown of life for me. He says, but not for me only, but for all that long for his appearing. The thing about this race, if we finish the course, all of us get a crown of life. Not just the first place one, but all of us get a crown of life. If we all exercise that self-discipline. And so I want you to think right now, and I'm, I'm not trying to encourage you to do a, a New Year's resolution because, you know, in some ways they work, some ways they don't. You know, uh, most people don't end up carrying through with them. And so I, I'm not trying to push you to do that. But what I am trying to push you to do is do what you know you need to do and don't wait on doing it. And, and whatever that is. And so, and whatever there is in your life that lacks self-discipline. You know, many times you can be disciplined in a whole bunch of areas of your life, but one or two is not so much. I want to encourage you to exhibit that self-discipline. I want to encourage you to live in the way that is right. I want you to, to do that. I want us to all do that. You see, when we mix all those things together, like we looked, and as we close, let's look back at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, in the text that we've been looking at all along. The text on the fruit of the Spirit. Because at the end of that he says about self-control and the rest of those. Against such there is no law. For these that have belonged to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see, if we've truly crucified what is behind. If we've crucified the old life. If we've crucified... The, the way that we used to live, then what we'll do is we'll, we'll have the fruit of the Spirit, and certainly not the least of which is self-control. 
and we'll put aside those things that cause us to show a lack of self-control. Too often, we didn't do such a good job of crucifying those things. We want to quit a bad habit. We want to quit a sin. We want to try something new. Instead of crucifying it, killing it, getting rid of it, we just kind of stick it to the side. And it's still within arm's length. It's still accessible. You know, like the, uh, the Garth Brooks song about marriage, we bury the, the hatchet but leave the handle sticking out. You know, we bury it, but yet we can still access <laughs> the handle. If you bury it, if you crucify it, you get rid of it completely. You, you cast it clear aside. And if we've crucified what is wrong within us, we don't go back and grab the handle once again. And self-control demands that we set that aside. And so, I want us to close with a prayer for greater self-control. And I want us to, to recognize the self-control that we need to have. And I want us to live better because of that. Whether you keep a, a New Year's resolution or not, that, that's your choice. I think it's good to do so, but not necessary by any means. But whatever you do, however you live... Self-control is going to be the most important thing because how much of a lack of self-control does it take to ruin you? Not much. And it's something you can have all through life and then ruin it. Well, we've got to maintain it. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you so much for the fruit of the Spirit and the time that we've had studying and learning about it and growing in it. And I pray that all of us have been enriched by the things that are there and the, the two truths that we've been able to see. Help us each and every one to have self-control. Help us to be masters over ourselves as we put us before you to be our master, to be our Lord. And we pray that you would use us and help us to, to show self-control in all that we say and do. With anything we might struggle with, with anything that we have difficulty with, we pray that we would exhibit self-control in it. We pray that we would try to do what's right and that we would, would live for you. Pray that you'll be with us all as we start a new year, as we start a new day, as we start a new time. We pray that all of us would live self-controlled lives. Help us to be good examples and help us to live for you. We pray that if there's anybody here that needs to come for prayers, that they would do so today. Or if there's anyone that needs to give their life to you, that they would do so today. We thank you and praise you in all things. It's through your son's name we pray. Amen. If you are not a Christian today, would you come and give your life to Christ? Let's crucify that old self. Let's get rid of that old way of life and put on the new. Come believe that Jesus died for you and repent of your sins. Confess Him as your Lord. You can be baptized today and all your sins can be washed away. If you are a Christian and you're struggling and you want us to pray with you and for you and help you in any way, would you please do so? Would you come while we stand and sing? <clears throat> Days are filled with sorrow and care. Our are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, 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 burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near, troubled soul, 
the Savior can see, <coughs> heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. 564, 564. We'll sing the first verse of this song and then be dismissed in prayer by Brother Mike Hall. First verse, 564. <clears throat> Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tenderest care. In thy pleasant pastures, feed us. For our food, thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus. 